Hey, Adam. Yeah. Are you feeling appreciated? Yeah. Good. Me too. Yeah. I'm Adam Manis. And I'm Peter Martin. And you're listening to the You'll Hear It podcast. Daily jazz advice coming at ya. Coming at you. You know what I appreciate, Pete? Yes. I appreciate our sponsor, Open Studio. I do too. Uh, jazz lessons from jazz legends. That's the tagline. Uh, go to openstudiojazz.com. Check out all of our courses. Courses by Peter Martin, mm. Jeffrey Keezer, Christian mm. McBride, mm. Diane Reeves, mm. Sean Jones, Bam. Gregory Hutchinson, Ruben Rogers. We just had Ruben and Greg in last week Ooh. and recorded two new mini courses. Oh, you're just spilling the beans, aren't you, buddy? Yeah. Oh, and uh, by the way, as of today, new brand new artist alert, Brazilian jazz pianist. Wait, don't say anything because it might come up at the end of the list. Bam. You know what I'm saying? All right. Um, yeah. Have you heard our new jingle for Open Studio? No. OpenStudioJazz.com. How do you like it? Uh, We're just trying it out. We're trying it out. And you're a professional musician? And we have a couple <laughs> We have a couple of our former sponsors featured on the table here. Oxford got? American Mug. I didn't get an Oscar, Oxford well, American you Mug. Didn't dry, you didn't go down to their HQ in Little Rock uh, last week like I did or three weeks ago nope. and perform at their beautiful venue, Oxford American. And look, big shout out, and we're going to link below to their brand new podcast. Have you heard it yet? No. I haven't either. But I mean, like <laughs> it just dropped, I think, today or yesterday. Okay. So um, I'm really excited about that. Uh, we're going to actually maybe do a little collab with them, good folks. And also... We want to give a big shout out to our former sponsors, Spindrift. They were like the sponsor that never was because I put it out there last week. I don't know if you remember oh. as a potential sponsor. Yeah, and nothing. it was going to happen, but you put a bad vibe on it with your anti-ketoism. No, your pro-ketoism. I mean, I'm drinking the Spindrift now. I I'm know. on board. Yeah. I'm out of, I'm knocked out of ketosis, but You're I feel... You're looking so bloated, man. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> Ever since you drank that stuff. That'll mess me up for Those seven weeks. calories are killing oh him, bro. Oh, my gosh. What do we got going on today? So today we're talking about, well, we're going to answer questions. So obviously the title is Top 7 Underappreciated Jazz Pianists. But let's listen to, uh, who is this question from? Joe. Joe. Hey, Peter. Hey, Adam. This is Joe from Arlington, Massachusetts. Listen to you guys almost every morning on my commute into work. Here's a challenge. Please name half a dozen jazz pianists who you think are underappreciated, why you think they're underappreciated, and why you think they're worthy of greater appreciation. Many thanks. Keep up the good work. All right. Later. Thanks, Bye. Joe. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Let Joe finish. There was a pregnant pause he added there, though, didn't <laughs> was, he? Yeah. Joe was, um, yeah. I mean, after he asked... Um, First of all, okay, thank you for the question. Half a dozen. We'll do you one better, of course. We're, go we're going Baker's dozen. Yeah, we're, we're going Baker's half dozen. What? Yeah. Six and a half? <laughs> oh, I guess that's right, wouldn't it? Yeah. No, wouldn't a Baker's half dozen be seven? I mean, always I, add one. I feel like, Joe, you listen to the show every morning. you got to know we're not going to do half dozen anything. <laughs> he was he was trying to see if we were paying attention. We're going to do seven. Yeah, we're, we're going to do, do seven, seven of everything. And I like this. He uh, We, we were nothing. debating when we heard it before whether or not he put a hat on a hat on a hat bonnet with that question. But actually, he wants to know the how, the who, the, who, the how, and the why. Okay, I think we can handle that. Okay, we can do I, that. I think so. Can I go first? You go first. Okay, I'm going to go first. Okay. You ready? Go. Okay, time to go. Go. Seven underappreciated jazz fans. Number one, Mary Lou Williams. Yeah. She, um, I mean, actually, everybody on this list, in a way, they are appreciated by true fans. For sure. Like, we didn't go, un these are not seven unknown, seven jazz pianists that are great that you've never heard of. But I think that she is a little bit underappreciated um, as a jazz pianist, as a composer, arranger, teacher, our, our good friend, good friend of the podcast and friend of Open Studio. I don't know if you knew this, Tom Townsend studied with Mary Lou Williams at Duke University back okay. in the, I think, late 70s. That's when she awesome. was teaching. Yeah, she yeah. taught for for a few years there and um you know my family has a lot of connections with with uh duke university and i always heard that name even as when i before i really got into jazz because my grandmother lived in north carolina my grandfather taught at duke and stuff and she had illustrious education ed, ed, you know she was an illustrious educator and um you know she she played with and hung with the best mm. and she was the one of the best and of course you know as being a female being african-american she really never got her due she definitely got her due and now you know they got the great mary lee williams festival there's some some wonderful folks working tirelessly to further expose her um her rich recorded and composition she wrote like over 100 <laughs> tunes you know yeah and um 
you know, to expose that to the greater masses, even um, as as she's not with us anymore. But she's definitely uh, worthy of much more appreciation. Yeah, Amazing totally piano agree. pianist. I mean, yeah. technique for days. I, I like what you said too about this list being not, you know, these are not pianists that you've never heard of. This is more like the pianists on this list. Their level of fame doesn't quite match their level of musicianship. Right. How good of a musician they are. Exactly. As opposed to some other people whose level of fame far outreaches. <laughs> We're going to do that list tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> the seven we, overappreciated. We could actually put together a list of like, you know, some pretty obscure pianists. I think we have done an episode yeah. of that back in the day. But, yeah, yeah. Um, this is not that. But I love that Mary Lou Williams is the first one because that's definitely someone whose level of skill is not matched uh, by their level of... No, their level of skill outmatches their level of fame and should be more appreciated. Yep. Uh, so mine, you know, I don't know if I would have put this on the list five years ago, mm. and it's Tommy Flanagan. Now, ah. Tommy Flanagan's been on some classic recordings, so why would you think he's been underappreciated? Yeah. He gets a little... Uh, it's been become kind of a meme. There's... I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not either. The Tommy Flanagan <laughs> on Giant Steps. Yeah. And uh, don't be hating. Don't be don't hatin'. be drinking the hater rage, y'all. Come on. I mean, you gotta understand. I would like someone to record their very first time playing over giant steps. Yeah, and see how that turned yeah. out. Like he got that music. You know what? A few minutes, maybe. Yeah, he brought it to the session. Brought it to the session. Yeah, and he had think about how much time you have between arriving at the session and starting the track, and like take one made it exactly. on the on the. Or I think it's take two is on the record. Yeah, or something. yeah. It's like come on, man. Yeah. Like. He did just fine. Tommy Flanagan was grossly unprepared for that session, but it was not his fault, no, you know. No, and he didn't not. sound like it. No, know? yeah. I want to hear some of these millennial pian. Oh, sorry, I don't want to get on my. Let me <laughs> yeah. get on my high horse. Just on your first attempt, you know, <laughs> it was a little bit unfair of Train to do that to him. Yeah, but I think he's completely val- vindicated by his amazing performance on saxophone colossus, Sammy yeah. Rollins saxophone colossus, and several other trio recordings. Oh yeah, many. You know, all did the way up Did you ever get a chance to hear him live? I heard him live once, and it was just mm. fantastic, yeah. and great solo sublime, pianist, sublime. and I, I love that guy. Yep. Yeah. That's great. I think that, that's a great one for the list. Okay, number three on our list of underappreciated jazz pianists. I'm going to go down south, 700 miles south of here, uh-huh. um, to the Gulf Coast, New Orleans area, and throw out a name, James Booker, Yeah, who's... You know, he's kind of known, certainly for people that know about New Orleans music, but, I mean, he was just a a monster pianist. Um, I never got a chance to see him live, unfortunately. He had kind of a tragic life, I mean, a crazy thing. But, I mean, he was very influential on a whole generation of New Orleans pianists and keyboardists. I mean, you talk about Dr. John, Harry Connick. I mean, everybody. David Torkinowski, um, you know, talks about him. David Torkinowski hung with him a lot. Wow. And, um... But, you know, Booker came up playing a lot of classical music and kind of was really in. He was like a a bridge between Liberace, jazz and gospel in in a very strange way. He he was um, but, you know, played a lot of classical, went to Xavier Prep, which a lot of uh, really good. uh, It was a Catholic uh, kind of prep school that that a lot of really good New Orleans players went to. And then he played on like, you know, Dave Bartholomew, who made a bunch of kind of regional and national and international hits, had had a studio um, recorded Fats Domino and all these people. James Booker was on that scene. Um, but if, if folks haven't heard of him, get this record called Junko Partner. That is a killing. I mean, he had a lot of stuff. We'll link to it below. Um, and um, that's a great record. And then, you know, kind of at the end of his career, it was a little bit tragic, but he played at the, at the Maple Leaf uh, up in Carrollton, which when I got to New Orleans, he, was, he had already passed away, but the, the club is still there. And um, he was like the house pianist there. And um, yeah. Oh, Fun fact about him. Mm-hmm. So Harry, he had a little bit of legal problems, a little bit of drug <laughs> use. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Um, Harry Connick Sr., who of course would be Harry Connick Jr.'s father, as this would as this would be. I don't know if you knew this. Was the dist- the longtime district attorney of New Orleans, of the city of New Orleans. I didn't of know that. Orleans Parish. Yeah, I didn't. Know um, that. And James Booker got into a little bit of legal problem. Got into a lot of bit of legal problem several times. And Harry Connick Sr., possibly in a little bit of a sly way, was able to oh, arrange oh, for this. him to not do any jail time in exchange for piano lessons for a young, a very young Harry Connick Jr. And history was made. And history was made. Look at yeah. that. Yeah. That's great, man. Well, wow. okay. Uh, so I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm, I'm, and I'm going to call an audible here because I was just, we were just talking about maybe sort of more obscure people, and I think uh, someone who is in, kind of in, in those dusty New York places. <laughs> you know I what see, I mean? I see, I see where you're going with this. But he is 
a monster of a pianist. Oh, he's a monster. And he's a monster. And that's David <laughs> Kakowski. Of course. You've probably heard of the name just because of how crazy <laughs> killing he is. But yeah. uh, he sounds like his name. He plays like his, David his name. David Kakowski. <laughs> and he's just so, it's like so intense New York jazz piano. Yeah. It, if, you're, if you're in a mood, like I can't do it every day. Right. But if I'm in a mood to really geek out yeah. piano wise, I'll I'll put on some Kukowski. He's great, man. Every time I see him, nice guy, super sweet guy, but great player. Um and uh for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, you can like you can turn on the smalls feed some yeah. nights and he's just there <laughs> going ape crap off the piano. <laughs> Sorry. Kind of like um kind of like cat crap. Kind of like cat computer. Cat puke in my computer. <laughs> Oh, uh, good one, good one. Okay, so number five, we're moving right along here. I like this of yeah. our underappreciated jazz pianist Shirley Horn. Now, Shirley Horn is underappreciated for her piano playing for sure. She's certainly known for it, but it's always this thing of oh, she was a great accompanist, which she was. But she was an amazing uh, pianist. She's not underappreciated on this podcast because we mention her a lot. We do I'm always we love her. Yeah, tooting the horn. I was a big fan and I got a chance to know her a little bit before she passed. Beautiful lady. Uh, beautiful person, and but just an incredible pianist, and uh, from D.C., our nation's capital. And I don't know. Fun fact is, I was researching today. I don't know if you know about this. She had a live at the Village Vanguard. Record. You know, Miles kind of. They always say he discovered her, but that's not exactly true. She had been gigging in D.C. and come to New York and stuff. But he kind of took special notice of her, and in the early '60s, he had her when he was doing one of his long runs at the Vanguard play during the intermission set, piano and sing and oh, stuff. That's very cool. Yeah, and that kind of got her really known by the because I mean Miles was like a tastemaker, you know, yeah. in terms of that kind of thing. And then she actually had a live at the Village Vanguard record that came out that cool. was kind of a breakthrough thing for her. But it was actually recorded just a few blocks from here in Gaslight Square, one of those clubs. That's awesome. And But it was written up wrong, and later on they fixed it and made it live at Gaslight Square. But she had a little St. Louis connection with that. That's which so was cool. great. And then she was like, you know, she was a mother and kind of kind of retired. She would just do gigs around D.C., and people knew about her, but she was raising her kids and whatever. And then, um, like, kind of late 70s, early, early 80s, 80s, Steeplechase Records, which that's kind of when I first got to know her. It was a little bit later, like mid-80s or whatever. She was doing these, like, trio records with her guys from D.C., Yeah. Uh, great uh, bass player who I'm forgetting his name now, but electric player, yeah. cool little trio. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, um, she got on Verve, had those really big records. I was gonna say, Here's you know, to life and she, she's she was one of the first um, artists I ever saw as a little kid that was a jazz musician because mm. she was so in pop culture in the early '80s when I was growing up, and she right. was on the Cosby Show and you know, right. Mr. Rogers and all this right. stuff. And yeah, yeah, I remember her very vividly. Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, number six is, I mean, this is a very famous musician, but I think <laughs> does not get talked about how great, and I mean that with a capital grr, yeah. uh, of a pianist he is, and that's Nat King Cole. Yep. Um, he started it in jazz, uh, and gospel at a young age. Um, yep. and of course is known for his vocal hits, yeah. you know, Sweet Lorraine. Uh, you have here, he's a pianist on... Citizen Kane, not yeah. what is that? <laughs> well, I, I first was when I was re when I was researching this, uh -huh. I was looking for a little fun fact. We don't really like to throw a little fun thing out there hmm. right now. And they said he was he was un um, attributed as the pianist in a in a scene in Citizen Kane. Huh. I was trying to remember back. I was like, I don't remember seeing him. I don't remember there being a pianist. But then it's been debunked. That's an internet myth. Oh. That it was some confusion because Orson Welles, creator of, have you seen Citizen Kane? Of course, man. Yeah. So red bud, no ro rosebud, rosebud. Oh, rosebud. Sorry, yeah, yeah. It was more of a whisper. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it was debunked. Orson Welles had talked about Nat King Cole, how he wanted that kind of sound or something. Right, and somebody, right, right. you know, how this thing goes. Sure, so. of course. Yeah. They, got, they got a Nat King Cole guy. Yeah. But I think it was Sweet Lorraine. That was like one of his, if not his first big hit. Mm, and enjoy. Yeah. And so I think smooth. that was like the beginning of less piano playing because, you know, he went he went big time, had the TV show, you know, the whole thing. But man, check him out with Lester Young, Buddy Rich, that trio. Ooh, nice. It was just so swinging. No bass player. And his his yeah. solo piano comp, the way he comps is... It's like a modified stride thing, and it yeah. just it feels so swinging and good, man. What a great buddy, uh, Rich. What a player. sweet guy. Oh, just a, and just a charmer. <laughs> a charmer. What a, a real teddy bear. Just a handsome dude. <laughs> oh, <Whoa. you know? laughs> all right. You'll hear no. Okay, so now we have number seven. Why don't you do number seven? Because you just were frothing at the mouth well, with all your transcribing. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. So no, number seven is kind of you know what we thought about with this list is uh, our very own brand new open studio artist. Bam! Today, right. Launching today, today, Elio Alves. 
uh, with a new course called Brazilian Jazz Piano. Elio Alves is a Brazilian jazz pianist of around our age, maybe yep. like splitting the difference between me and you. Yep. And he is just marvelous. He played with Joe Henderson. He yep. played with a bunch of cats. And He's um, played with everybody in New York. Every, I mean, he's like been in New York for 25 years or something like that. Yeah, maybe more. longer. Yeah, he's actually a little older. He's got he's got kind of a little a little a little uh, baby face. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Stuff. Oh, yeah okay. He's a little older. He's oh. yeah, not much, but yeah. Um, anyway, fantastic pianist, monster pianist, and, yeah. a, and great Brazilian pianist. And we're, we're so excited to have him. We're super stoked. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna link below to the the new course and also the live at Brazil YouTube. That was one of our great live at Open Studio concerts that he headed up with Eddie Ribeiro. And yeah, and yeah. Romero, oh, we should Bob. definitely link to that concert. So that's for those of you who who don't know. Like when we bring our artists here to shoot these courses, oftentimes we'll do a live concert here in our studio. Yeah. We'll stream it. We'll have uh, we'll open it up to uh, the public. And this was, I think, our second one. Yep, Elio's, and it was just, yep. man, yeah, like you said, Elio, Romero Lubombo, uh, uh, Adu Ribeiro, Bob Debu, local uh, St. Louis legend. Yeah, he's from the um, northernmost part of Brazil called uh, South St. Louis. Oh, no, he's from Texas. That's kind of <laughs> close to Brazil. It's on the way there. Yeah, it's closer than we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this is good. Yeah, Nailed it again. What can we say, man? <laughs> it's just getting too easy. It's, it's too easy. But this was fun. We hope you guys enjoyed our seven underappreciated jazz pianists. And uh, once again, we're brought to you by Open Studio, openstudiojazz.com for the finest. Uh, oh, can we do one yeah. more plug, quick yeah. plug? So sure. uh, if you're listening to this in St. Louis, come out to uh, Jazz the Bistro tonight. That's right. Jazz St. Louis. We're doing a little piano duo. We're doing a little duo, duo piano situation. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be fun. Grand piano. Jazz St. Louis, Grand and Washington. We're going to do it back to back, I think. Really? No. Mono, mono, <laughs> el baco. Blindfolded. Um, that's good. Well, till tomorrow. You'll hear it.